Hey folks, welcome to the Royalty Investing in 2020 webinar. We'll be getting started in just a moment. I was just late waiting for more people to come on. So just hang tight, give us a minute or so and we'll get started. All right. Welcome, everybody. Um, my name is Eric Stout. I'm the head of Marketplace Demand here at Royalty Exchange. Beside me is the man behind the marketplace, Matt Smith, our CEO. Um, and today we are going to be going through um, what it takes to be successful uh, in, in investing in royalties in 2020. So um, on the agenda for us is uh, why are investors flocking to music royalties at this time? Why is money pouring into the space? Um, some risks that you want to look out for in, in, in royalty investing in general, five ways that you can get involved in royalty investing today, um, and then how our premium membership really gives you an edge uh, when looking to invest in this space, and then we'll end with a Q&A. So uh, we recommend that you ask questions along the way. We have uh, someone here named Anthony that will be chiming in from the wings that will be answering questions or asking your questions. So use the webinar feature, the Q&A feature there at the bottom of your screen um, throughout the webinar and we'll, we'll try and get some of those questions in throughout. And then at the end, we'll end with a Q&A session as well. The Q&A part is the most fun part of this. So really <laughs> any questions that you might have that you, that you want answered, please ask them and we will, we will, if necessary, stay here all night until they're all That's right. answered. <laughs> all right. Um, but thanks for joining. Let's get started. So who are we? Uh, if you, you probably know already, we're Royalty Exchange and what our role essentially is in this space is um, we are the marketplace where m most music royalty transactions occur. Um, over the last four years now, more than 800 deals have transacted on our platform. We have more than 27,000 registered investors. In total, it's $71 million in transactions. All of this gives us a unique view in the market and really kind of one of the big focus of today is really to share with you what we see, um, what we understand to be the risks, what we see as the opportunities. And of course, I'm hoping to uh, make you interested in joining our premium membership, All Access Investor. But whether you do that or not, you'll leave tonight knowing a lot more about music royalties. Absolutely. So let's jump into what has changed in the music royalty landscape um, that kind of sets us up as we head into 2020. Um, so the first thing that you really want to know about the music business right now is just the boom of streaming. Um, so if you look at the distributions from ASCAP and BMI, these are the two largest performing uh, rights, performance rights organizations that deal with distributing out these royalty payments. Their distributions grew 7% year over year from 2018 to 2019 um, at an all-time high, both cresting over a billion dollars in distributions. So, and most of that was driven by streaming. Yes. Um, Another interesting stat, we looked at uh, US recording, recorded music uh, revenue from 2010 to uh, the end of 2019, and it grew from 10, uh, sorry. 7%. 7% from 2010 to 80% um, through 2019, which is just a, a huge leap in just nine years. Yeah, that's right. So much of it is moving over streaming. Of course, most of you listening probably have some streaming service, whether it be Spotify or Amazon, you've got something but that's caused uh, the transition has been quite rapid over to that. And, and it's, it's really fueling all the growth of the music business. 
at this point. And to support that is just spend in general. So in the UK alone, um, UK streaming spend, so what people are spending on all those different apps that Matt mentioned, um, is up over 20%, 23.5% year over year. So another great stat just supporting uh, that streaming boom that is, is really driving music today. And the streaming part is important because um, one of the things that what this, we're trying to explain the entire landscape of this from an investor perspective. And that one of this, the, the, it's growing, it's booming overall. And there's a transition from other sources of revenue to streaming. And why that's important and why that sets up the, the, the groundwork, why more people are investing in these assets than ever is because streaming is a lot more stable than the other sources of income. We have over in our proprietary database, more than 600 billion data points um, and in, within that, we can see that certainly among the largest categories of income, streaming income is definitely the least volatile, which makes it the most predictable. Yeah, absolutely. Which obviously for investors looking at the past, trying to predict the future, that's a really great uh, stabilizing force. Exactly. Yep. And the other thing is that the other thing that is helping to drive more people into music royalties is the fact that the folks that have been early and have made investments in the space have started to actually see what the returns actually are. And so for us, and this, of course, there are other ways to invest in music royalties, but the average return of investors who have bought assets on our platform is 12.1% annualized. So that's an incredible return, which is very obviously difficult to achieve in today's market. And um, that case makes this, and now that people start to see these numbers and start to see these results, that's driving a lot of new capital formation. Yeah, you know, and obviously 12.1% is a great return anywhere. Um, but also these are uncorrelated assets, right? And that's something that we'll talk about a little bit more later. But obviously with uncertainty in the market as an investor, that's something all of us are talking about, right? Exactly. So, yeah. Um, yeah, and so I was saying, talking, it's creating lots of new capital formation. So what I mean by that really is that there's lots of professional money uh, really getting into the space now. Now there has been for years. There's some people that have been participating quietly in the background, really deploying capital intelligently, but there's lots of, of new folks that have joined as well. And you know, one of the most um, uh, well-known is, is a fund based out of the UK called Hypnosis, which is they've raised a, a, a very large amount of money, estimated around $800 million at this point, and have deployed about 650 million of that already. And um, high profile deals that have brought a lot of attention to the space. You know, Warner's uh, done a partnership with a private equity fund um, which again, another multi hundreds of millions of dollars of capital. Tencent made a huge investment in, in UMG and Universal Music, essentially um, validating the value of the assets that they have in their catalog, these IP assets, and there's tons and tons more. So you have this overall environment again, where it's the music industry is booming, it's led by streaming, streaming is less volatile, the returns are starting to show up, people are seeing great results and more and more people are coming into the space. Yeah, absolutely. And what, what does that really mean in the long run is that the future is only getting brighter, right? Yeah. Um, with the transition that's happening in this industry, there's, there's uh, more and more forecasts, particularly one most notable by Goldman Sachs that says that um, essentially this business is going to double over the next 10 years. Yeah. Um, so and that seems pretty outlandish, you know, but the thing right. is, is that when they first came out with their, when they with their predictions, um, about the time that we really launched this, the, our business, uh, it was taken by the music industry as sort of outlandish, uh, their predictions. And all they've done since their initial prediction about four years ago is increase it. Uh, so, so while these numbers seem large to be able to double from where it is already over the course of the next decade is a lot, but I mean, they've only been too conservative so far. So I'm, who knows if it'll actually be at the number, but yeah. the bottom line is, is that there's a lot of factors that are driving growth. Yeah, and again, just touching back on that correlation, right? I mean, you yeah. won't see this type of prediction in hardly any other industry right That's now right. because of so much uncertainty, right? We're, we're long overdue for some sort of correction um, is what people are continually saying, growth being more flat, potentially negative for longer term projections in a lot of areas. Um, and so this is pretty pretty bullish compared to, to many Extremely industries bullish. today, Extremely right? Bullish, yeah. um, and so what's driving that uh, growth is in those, in those estimates are three real categories, right? We have emerging markets. So just the spread of, of uh, smart devices and things like that 
Um, so there's more and more connected people online, um, just in general across the world, right? So that just there's more users, period, that are that are having access to to music. In you don't have to print and ship CDs to every corner of the earth in order to be able to potentially sell the music with these streaming services and other digital access. Essentially, you know, you have new consumers of music that become of, of, of come on market. And the other thing I think is this is one as near and dear to my heart <laughs> is uh, devices. Um, my kids pr listen to music a lot and, and I, have a ten, I have a 12 year old and a 14 year old and they listen a lot on their Alexa devices. And because of that, then I, you know, subscribe to Amazon streaming service in addition to uh, subscribing to Spotify streaming service otherwise. So there's more, more ways to consume music. And so that's, um, that's more subscription services that kind of get tied to it. And music is becoming just a bigger and deeper part of our, our lives in general. Even might've been a huge fan of music forever, but, the truth is, if it was really hard to actually access music you wanted to listen to, you didn't. And so that's changed things dramatically. You know, one yeah. of the, and one of the things I think that's really important is that, you know, the music industry really, really got disrupted in a really hard and painful way uh, through Napster and then the iTunes downloads of, of music, you know, the single songs instead of having to buy a whole album. But what's different now, and this is kind of a huge, this is like an option. Um, holding an option on, on that maybe Goldman is actually still underestimating what might happen is, is that the music industry is, is just much smarter today about looking for ways to license the content, you know, working with um, other, you know, novel solutions for it. And a couple of examples, uh, my 12 year old daughter, again, is, is a huge fan of this app called TikTok. <laughs> and TikTok is, uh, music is integral in TikTok. And so this creates, if, if you happen to own a library of music, and um, you know, then then now there's a new way that it can be monetized that literally didn't exist not long ago. It's it's brand new. Um, the Peloton bikes, these are you know the the, the home um, exercise, exercise yeah. bikes. You know, they they license music and use it in classes. It's it's really integral to the product, and um, that's a new source of revenue now for all the rights holders in the ecosystem. So if you own the rights, you benefit from all of these technology innovations. And we're pretty lucky, we're pretty fortunate in that we, uh, we get a kind of a, an early view on all this because of our association with Techstars. They have um, an accelerator program. It's focused on music technologies. And um, you know, uh, Peloton is a, is a member with us in it. Um, Warner Music is a member with us in it. Sony, Sony's Innovation Fund and some great music industry managers and other participants. And essentially we get pitched these remarkable new technologies and ideas for, for the way that music could be licensed in the future. And the most interesting thing about it is, is not as much that the, the new technology that's coming out and the deals that we get pitched, but it's the change in attitude really that the music industry has about trying to be proactive, trying to make it so that, you know, theoretically you can consume music everywhere in the games that you play yeah. um, online, um, everywhere you go, uh, that music takes up a bigger market share of, the, of, the, of your sort of attention time. And ultimately that's more money in the pockets of license holders. Yeah, it's amazing to me that, you know, a class on Peloton can have thousands of people that because of that playlist are now getting those musicians are getting paid and those those songwriters exactly are, are if, money you wrote, if you wrote a song and all of a sudden some you know the, the 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 trainer in a Peloton class decides that this song we're going to use and it hasn't otherwise been you know been in a popular zeitgeist in a while your, your new royalty stream is going to start showing up for you so yeah. these things are happening all the time and we have one weird example which I think is worth talking about around TikTok yeah, with one of one of, one of uh, with what with a an asset that actually transacted on our platform. Yeah, absolutely. There was a, there was a song I was just looking at this the other day that that um, was purchased on our, on our site um, was making it you know a couple thousand perhaps a month. Um, that now as one of the videos on TikTok that went viral had this song in the background, and now that's bringing in tens of thousands of dollars per month. So that investor has made. Like just done quite well for himself. Over two hundred percent return or something like that in a very short period of time. In a in a very short period of time. Yeah. So now, but um, now that's not the, the we're not, that's not the norm. The assets <laughs> that are primarily sold on our platform. And you don't do it from a speculative standpoint. I mean, right. we're looking the assets that are sold on our platform. People are looking at the income history and how it's performed in the past. And I would be more rational about the way you buy things. Right. But th I think that point illustrates how new technologies the effort to get licensing out there in different places creates this optionality. If you own the underlying IP, there's opportunities there that are very difficult to predict today. Yeah, absolutely. 
So now we want to jump into five ways to invest in royalties. I know that's something that a lot of people are really interested in. Obviously, we've talked about now the market and all of this growth. So how can you how can you get access to that? Um, before we jump into that, though, with every investment class, there are risks, right? And so we want to we want to cover that. Um, yeah, yeah, exactly. And they're not these are just broad categories. You know, any specific. You know, if you're if you're investing in a private equity fund, obviously it's going to have its own unique set of risks. But these are just things to be if you're if you're totally new to the space to be aware of. And especially if you imagine this all the way down to the terms of if you're going, if you happen to know somebody who was a writer on a song and it's, you know, it's popular and it's generating royalty income and you're going to buy it, you want to buy it from them, then, you know, these things are, are seriously something you'd have to worry about. Obviously, if you're using experts in another way, uh, whether it be through our platform or, you know, or through a private equity fund, you can, you can hedge those a little bit. But the number one thing is counterparty risk, pretty much in everything. Um, <laughs> You know, you got to make sure that the person who you're buying the asset from actually owns the asset and they have the ability to transfer it. Um, and it's it's a little bit complicated uh, within the music space because basically there's two distinct copyrights. One of them earns royalties on a statutory basis, meaning the royalty rates are set by uh, a board that's powered by Congress to do it. And they can adjust rates over time and they, they have. Um, and another one, it's, it's uh, between a private party. So it could a label and a band, for instance. And so really, um, depending upon which, where you're focusing on the copyright, it can make a big difference of, of, of how much due diligence you might have to do. If you're focusing on the statutory assets, uh, it's a lot easier versus focusing on assets that you have to really go and read the original <laughs> signing agreement between the band and, and the label in order to understand it. So, so counterparty risk is a big thing. You gotta make sure right. that the person who's selling it to you has the right to sell it to you. Course, right? Which is something we certainly obviously bet for, but right. something to be aware of. <laughs> exactly. I mean, a big part of what it is is that there's a whole certain class of assets that we just don't uh, we don't deal with on our platform because there is an effective way of mitigating that on behalf of our investors. Exactly. So that's one. Number one. The other one. I think this is this is the <laughs> hardest one for a new for a new asset class like this is just how do you even value it? How do you actually know what these things are worth? Right. And there's all kinds of different you know models that you can build around them, but I think that there's some good uh, heuristics, I think, that are very important. And for us, one of the biggest errors we see people make is if they're relying on kind of a familiarity bias. Like, you might be a classic rock guy and love classic rock and think that, you know, think that no, you know, hip hop is a fad and it's going to go away. And so you might discount sort of out of hand that hip, any hip hop music that might come across your platform. Of course, people have been saying hip hop is a fad for at least 25 years now, just for the record. Um, so, but you, so you might, if you don't know the artist, if you don't know that brand, essentially, you might go, well, that's probably not a valuable asset. And I think that that kind of familiarity bias it could, can definitely cause big mistakes. We've also seen people who just are totally in love with an artist and um, from an investment perspective, get a little get aggressive in their bidding because they just want to own a piece of, of that music and maybe, maybe returns aren't their top priority. And maybe that's why they bid as much. But familiarity bias, you got to be aware of. Yeah, I mean, music is just, deeply personal, right? I mean, you're, it's an emotional art form, so you feel yeah. like you might know it, but from an investment side, yeah, maybe not. <laughs> exactly, and that's why one of the biggest things that we do is that we, and all of our, and all of the assets that are on our platform, we show the income history of it, what it's actually earned, what the sources are, what some of the trends are. We try to provide analytic tools so that you can value catalogs or get a sense of the catalogs value, even if it's an artist you're not familiar with. It's actually a question here we have from the folks asking whether or not investors should invest into an A&R um, team for their, for their process in order to properly uh, evaluate the royalties they see. Yeah, I mean, uh, so someone is asking, in case you didn't hear, whether or not they, should, they need to invest in an A&R team to know if these assets make sense for them to invest in. And I think um, if you are- on music people, what's A&R mean? A&R, yeah. So A&R is basically, these are the people who find and develop artists. Um, these are, these are you know, very common in, in music labels, certainly. And you know, for new artists, it's, it's important that that sort of expertise definitely has some value. But we focus specifically on assets that have a track record of income, a track record of income. So really, you can strip away all that specialty knowledge. I mean, to me, the A&R talent, the, the ability to succeed in A&R looks a lot like black magic. I don't understand it. I don't really know how you can model anything around it. But if I have an income history from, a, from an asset and I can see the sources of it and I can see it's been around for a decade, I can make reasonable estimations of how to do it. So we focus 
a lot on the analytic side of the catalog and really help people on our platform make better choices because of those analytics. Absolutely. And one of the key ones, by the way, is, is something called catalog age. We, we actually invented a statistic we call dollar age. And we find that that's, that statistic essentially is the single greatest, uh, the single best tool essentially to immediately value um, kind of the quality of the earnings of the catalog. Like if they've been, essentially, if it's been earning for a long time, it's likely to continue earning for a long time in the future. If it's been around for a month, you know, it's, a, it's a, obviously a much riskier gamble. The sources of income, we talked about that before with streaming being more stable. That's another thing you really got to be, be aware of. There are certain ones that are prone to uh, incredible spikes. Um, sync in particular is one. Um, and, and then the other thing is that there's a whole class of music that earns royalties, certainly, but earns them in, in, in somewhat different ways. And we're just kind of dumbly, dumb, uh, in, in a dumb way, lumping them all in one category called production music. And essentially, this is like the, the music cues that might exist in the back of a, you know, a reality TV show when maybe Kim Kardashian closes the door and walks into the Louis Vuitton store. That music isn't necessarily really, um, that music is not, people are not seeking it out on the streaming services and trying to consume it. Instead, it's something that's just sort of happening. Uh, it's, it could be replaced. There's a suitable replacement in the market for it, essentially. So we don't, we don't do that at all. Okay, so we stay away from that. So valuation risk is, is, those are the major things. There's regulatory risk, which is serious. Um, now, fortunately, the regulatory risk uh, at this point, it's all pointing in the, for the benefit of the rights holder. And I think these things have given more confidence, again, to funds coming into the space. Uh, as I said, there's a certain portion of, the, of these rights that are uh, the rates, rates are set by this copyright royalty board. And they have, they, they have their, their mandate currently is for those royalty rates to increase by 44% over a five year period. So if anything, um, all of the work regulatory right now is in support of rights holder. So if you own some of these royalty rights, you're, you benefit from the changes that are happening. But of course that could change at any time. Yeah, right. And finally, disruption risks. This is what nearly killed the music business, it seemed, you know, after Napster. Those, it's still there. The, and it's still something could still happen that's going to fundamentally disrupt things. But I think that uh, the music industry, as I was saying before, is much better positioned today than they've ever been. They're being very proactive. Um, gaming companies, uh, apps have really figured out that people love music. And if you can figure out how to actually integrate licensing into these products, you can actually make them more commercially successful. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm bullish on, on, on being on the right side of this at least for the foreseeable future. Yeah, it's all that optionality we were talking about earlier. Exactly, yep. But those are the major risks that are out there. Certainly. Four big categories, yeah, worth, worth checking on. So let's talk about some of the things you can invest in. Yeah, so let's actually get into that. Yeah. So these are things that aren't, we're gonna start, all these things are not us. And we think it's important for you to understand the landscape and, you know, and buying the assets directly through our marketplace just might be totally inappropriate for a lot of you. So there are other options. A couple of them are, are these big conglomerates. I mean, Vivendi, uh, they own Universal Music. Uh, they are, you know, the, you could buy them uh, publicly. They, uh, they, they are a conglomerate. They have an incredible catalog, though. Universal's got a remarkable yeah. catalog that's that's producing huge amounts of cash for Vivendi. Uh, the unfortunate thing is, if you buy Vivendi, of course, you're buying everything within the Vivendi empire, including an Italian telecom, and you know, you're not by not getting direct maybe exposure to the underlying assets at Universal. Their incredible catalog. You know, you're, and you're kind of subject to some of the risks of maybe there's a, a worker strike at the Italian telecom or a pension problem or something like that. Who knows? Uh, but it's, a, it's not a direct access to it. But still, great catalog, remarkable catalog. And the same is true of Sony. Sony has a remarkable catalog, but you're, you know, they have a hardware business too that you're investing in. Tencent is a Chinese company, traded though in New York Stock Exchange. And, um, you know, they... Uh, they are making a big plays in, in music. And I think that they're, I don't, I'm not making a recommendation on any stock, but I mean, they, they're very active. They even recently, we mentioned earlier, they made a huge investment in the underlying catalog at Universal. Yeah. I'm not sure what the long-term plan with it is, but it's certainly a vote of confidence for Universal's catalog. Yeah. So public stock. Public uh, stock. Public, public companies. Yeah. Now there are some public funds. I mentioned hypnosis earlier. Hypnosis right. has gotten a lot of great headlines. Um, you know, they bought, um, they bought uh, about, they said about $650 million worth of assets so far. They're moving fast and attempting to acquire a lot more. They are traded on the London, London Stock Exchange and the tick, under the ticker SONG. And, um, you know, it's certainly a way that you can get access to these, uh, much more direct access than you would through one of these conglomerates. 
to you know two underlying catalogs and they pay a dividend as well and mm -hmm. certainly worth looking into if you want access to the public markets there's another one that is not active at all it's uh, basically a yeah, it's, a, it's an old catalog that's basically been generating royalties for a long time. This is an over-the-counter traded stock. It's called Mills Music Trust. It's a tiny market cap. I think, you know, it's under $9 million market cap. But they, they last I checked, they, they, you know, their dividend was, was, uh, almost, was basically about as good as the returns were uh, of investors of experience on our platform. Unfortunately, it's very difficult to buy any of that stock because right. it's so thinly traded. Um, yeah. I've certainly tried in the past. But... Um, and, you know, certainly it's an option that's out there. And maybe, you know, if you maybe you can buy through the private markets, some yeah. of it's in the stock that they have. In any case, those are two options that you should consider if you're really looking at much more direct exposure to the space rather than going through a conglomerate to the underlying catalogs. Exactly. Yep. Of course, there are these technology companies that are really driving the, the distribution of music. And Spotify, you can buy them directly. Uh, you can buy the stuff, you can get, at least you're buying a music oriented company directly versus buying these much again larger companies that have exposure to things well outside of music but they certainly are benefiting from you know using music as part of the platforms and it is a way to get exposure um it's certainly with apple and amazon it's definitely roundabout with spotify it's a lot more direct the trouble is is that the vast majority of all of the revenue spotify generates goes into the pockets of guess who the rights holders right. The underlying, it's better to own, in my opinion, and I think in, you know, certainly in hypnosis opinion and, um, and others, that under owning the underlying intellectual property is the best position to be in, essentially, because for all these services, with all the distribution, they got to pay you to be able to use any of it. Right. Absolutely. Well, and I think something to, to consider, too, is that all of these, of course, are publicly traded. So yes. you have to consider the macroeconomic factors that could impact these stocks, whether that's always married or not. Market psychology, all right. of those things can impact pricing, whether or not, you know, the boom in streaming could carry Spotify through, you know, a potential market event. That's a, a different question, right? Yeah, who knows? There are analysts who cover Spotify. We are not analysts. We are we not cover Spotify. <laughs> okay. So the other one, and I just think this is interesting. Personally, I find this very interesting. Now, I don't own, let me see. I don't own any of the stocks we've mentioned for the record yeah. uh, at this point, but I will say I'm very, I'm always fascinated with what a guy named John Malone is doing. Um, uh, John Malone has, um, has Liberty Media as, as the name of his company, and he's made investments in the space very uniquely all the way up and down the stack, all the way from ticketing and, at, you know, and, uh, and venues through Live Nation, all the way to distribution with Pandora and iHeartMedia. Um, and then also, you know, Sir the Sirius XM, owning that, a big piece of it anyway. Yeah. And I think that, so he's got exposure to everything from, from the actual, from, from venues, which, you know, live has been a big growing area within right. the music space for sure. Um, all the way through actually owning some, a lot of the IP because of the unique content they create through Sirius. So the, he has this weird structure with these tracking stocks that he's doing. It's really hard to always know what exactly the long-term vision is, but there's something there and he's made, made some big plays recently. And it's worth, if you're interested in the space to be kind of watching and at least aware of what's happening in the headlines with John Malone and Liberty Media. Yeah. And they do a lot of other interesting things yeah. as well. They, they, they also about Formula One. Formula One. Yeah. The Braves. The Braves. So. Yeah. And they, they've got a big stake in uh, the, the, the company that owns the, the Pepsi Center here. So in any case. Yeah. All right, other things, private equity. If you happen to be in a particular position where you have the option to invest in private equity, there are some firms that are, have, have uh, done very well in the space and are doing lots of new things. And just to, I'll mention a couple. Round Hill's been around for a while. Uh, Round Hill takes a, uh, they buy all the copyrights, they buy more of an active interest in the, in the IP and thus then have to build out the operations around exploiting it. But they've been around for a while, they've raised uh, several rounds of money, or at least two that I know of for sure. And, um, you know, they were one of the people that were really early in. Uh, Shamrock, we worked with, um, is uh, great guys over there. Again, if you have the opportunity to work with them, I encourage it. They're just fantastic people. Um, they have a very smart approach to it all. And then, you know, recently we, we mentioned Warner, um, you know, uh, developing a partnership with, the, with, uh, with Providence, uh, which is a PE firm, um, to go out and acquire a bunch of assets. And they've raised, I think, around 600 million so far. Yeah. Um, we've talked to the team there, really impressive people, and um, they've got a lot of capital now to deploy. So if you happen to be able to get access to private equity, 
you know, you can get big, very well-known catalogs and, you know, there's all kinds of tools that, that private equity has to improve margins and all that. So, you know, I would encourage you, if you can, you know, maybe consider these and there are plenty of others out there. I'm yeah. not trying to insult anybody by not mentioning them here. Yeah. New fund formation in this space is, is booming it's for good. sure. Um, and it's more just finding that access. Luckily there's more access now than yeah. ever before, but exactly. it's still pretty challenging to find the funds before the raise because they're is. raising pretty quick. They are raising fast. They are raising fast. As, you know, go just one hypnosis has just been announcement after announcement of new capital raise right. and, and, and new, new catalogs purchased. So there's a lot of activity in the space for yeah. sure. So of course the last one is us and we are very biased. Of course, yeah. I mean, <laughs> you know, so this is, we put our blood, sweat and tears in this business over the last four years. And we've yeah. done some, we've produced some remarkable uh, results for the people that have participated in the platform, both on the artist side who had access to capital they'd never had access to before. Mm -hmm. And for the investors in terms of the returns that they're able to achieve with this you know, uncorrelated asset class. Yeah. And some of the biz biggest things about if you haven't participated in our platform before, some things you should know about kind of our approach versus some of the other ones I mentioned. Right. Uh, big one is direct ownership. So essentially you're buying directly, essentially title to the, the, the income, the royalty income rights from the artist, you know, from the person who produced them and owns them currently. So the, there's no like middle people in the way of, of that income stream, you know, taking a tax on it or whatever. You don't have to worry about that capital uh, that's being produced by those being deployed for new catalog acquisition that under terms you might not like or or um, a and r for new artist development or something like that so it's just it's direct access to an income source and most of these uh, royalties actually pay quarterly so it's just to get the check every quarter as these as these assets are, are utilized and licensed yeah that lends to a much better cost structure right so there's not management fees there's not all of that operating expense. That exactly. Now we do make it easy by, by providing a free administrative service essentially so that we collect and distribute the royalties uh, you know, to you so that basically, you know, if you have lots, if you're trying to deploy a million dollars, for instance, in the space, you don't have to, you know, have to worry about remembering and coordinating maybe the, the, the hundred catalogs you might have acquired uh, in order to-, to Tons of different distributors and, and exactly. places to get them. So we make it as easy as possible, of course. Yeah. But direct ownership is key. The other thing is that for the most part, there are a couple of exceptions, but almost everything that's transacted on our platform to date is totally passive. Uh, most of the time it's songwriter royalties. So this, and the songwriter doesn't, isn't in a position to really try and push, um, there's really not much that, 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 they're not in a position where they can go out and really exploit the rights on their own anyway. They need cooperation with a publisher and to do it. So. The decisions about the exploitation of, of the rights are often uh, the publisher and the label anyway. Right. So really, the big thing is the songwriter is just passively collecting the income today, and you are purchasing that passive right. There's a couple of questions regarding what types of royalties are they actually buying here? Are we talking about copyrights? Are we talking about royalties? What if someone covers a song to a song that I've, that I've purchased? Does that, do I still earn money? Yeah. Can you maybe address some of those questions, please? Yeah. Now, see, there's a whole bunch of different issues here, but I think that the, the mostly what is being sold on the platform is uh, songwriter royalties, usually their performance rights. So that's basically every time it's if it's played on the radio, if it's played live, uh, then a royalty is earned from it. And most of the time, okay, the, the copyrights are not actually transferred along with it because there's not really any benefit in buying the copyright anyway. Um, if you don't have the ability to exploit the copyright. Instead, you're buying the right to all of the income that's produced during that period, whether it be the life of rights of it or maybe it's during, for a 10-year term. So essentially, you're just buying direct access to the income mm -hmm. at the lowest cost possible and then um, and collecting the income over time. Does that answer the question? Yes, and if someone were to say, re-record a song. Great question. Okay, so there are two basic copyrights. There's the there's the the composition copyright. That's sort of the written word and lyrics, um, uh, the musical notes on paper, essentially what the writer earns from. And then there's the actual sound recording, which is what we actually hear on the radio or in the streaming service. So if you own the rights to the the um, the composition, you earn royalties, however that composition is used. So one of my favorite examples is. Uh, Nine Inch Nails uh, had a song called Hurt, and it was very popular. A lot of, you know, you may know it, you may not know it, but it was actually, I don't know, maybe 
12 or 15 years later, uh, recorded as a cover by Johnny Cash. And that was actually more popular than the original release by Nine Inch Nails was. And, um, and it's a totally different tone, it sounds totally different, and yet the songwriters earned royalties on all of it. It's one of the benefits of the composition copyright actually versus sound recording. Yeah, absolutely. So the other thing is that you know, we are pro this market. So we aren't looking, because we are not deploying capital personally in it. We're not, although I have bought assets personally, <laughs> although you know, we're, not, we're not a hedge fund, we're not a private equity firm. You know, we're not trying to beat out other parties and acquire the assets. Our whole, the nature by which we do everything is just as transparent as possible. Meaning the more information that we can share with everybody about all the transactions that occur in the marketplace, the more, the better decisions that all participants can make. And, and then the, the more fairly valued these assets can be. So for instance, I mean, there's, there's one uh, upstart hedge fund who, who literally their entire models on, on forecasting how they might perform as a fund were based upon the publicly available information on our website. Yeah. Because this is a pretty secretive industry. People don't like to publish any kind of information about what's happening. And the only real publicly available information in any bulk was the stuff that we've done publicly. So right. transparency is super key in everything that we do. And um, you know, the last point I think that is important to talk about, of course, is the yield. Yield results are good. Uh, right. Of course, you could, you could, one of the major ways people buy assets on our platform is through auctions. You could get totally outrageous in an auction, of course, uh, but that's your choice to pay that. You're going to be compressing your yield, obviously, if you overpay for something. But the results that we have, um, like I said, average 12.1%. It's really phenomenal. Yeah, and the, another thing is that um, some people ask us, well, you know, with uh, all these new funds coming to the market, what do you like? You know, I th actually, I had my brother-in-law sent me an email <laughs> the other day based upon a hypnosis article. And he said, I thought you guys were like the, you know, you, you guys recorded <laughs> the market by now. That's, honestly, so I got this message from him. And I'm like, are you kidding? It actually doesn't make any difference. Oh, like the more people that are participating in this, it's just validation of what we're doing. And, I, and just to be a little, like maybe to be a little more, uh, take a little more credit than we should. I really think the fact that, that our, what we've done to make the market more legible to all parties mm -hmm. has just encouraged this, this, this large capital formation that's occurred. And, you know, and of course, hypnosis has done an incredible job of raising capital and deploying it as well as all these others. And I, you know, can't, I'm trying to take credit for what they've done at all, but I do think the fact that we've made the whole space more legible to all participants is only a common good for everybody. And that's our goal. I mean, we've had, let's just say, uh, more than one of the parties that we have shared with you earlier today have actively participated in our marketplace already. Mm -hmm. So, our goal is to build a big playground where whether you're an individual songwriter making $5,000 a year or you're a major music publisher, you can, you can, you can get liquidity, you can get uh, fair market value for your assets. Yeah, no, it's great. So I think next it makes sense to kind of jump into what does it actually look like on our platform um, to, to get involved. And so there's two primary platforms that we have uh, on our site. One is the auction house, as, as Matt's been, I mean, talking about, that's where you can really get the, the true market price for an asset by bidding, bidding up that asset, right? So this is where new assets come on. Um, you know, we have songwriters that, that want to bring their, their works to, to the market. And so that's one of the primary places. That's kind of where we got to start as yeah, a marketplace. Really. It's, just imagine it's like eBay. Okay. So, you know, the asset gets listed. You have, we'll go into what all you see when an asset is listed if you don't know already. But ultimately, it's a bidding process by parties, and, and it finds fair market value essentially through that competitive bidding process. Again, exactly. very great, really great for the sellers, but also still because um, maybe because of the, the newness of the asset class, there's still incredible opportunities that are available. Yeah, absolutely. One thing I, I love to mention about the auction house is that um, you know you compare it to eBay. We have a five minute rule, so no one's getting auction sniped at the last minute. True, so yeah. any bids that come in in the last five minutes of an auction resets the clock up to five minutes. So when you're bidding, be aware of that. That if you yeah. think you're the winner, you got to make sure that that auction ends. And no one we're really trying to find fair here. market value with these assets, uh, for, just to make. I mean, we have we serve the the rights holder community, and we one of the, our promises to them is that we is transparency and fairness. And that they get they, that they really we do really create a competitive environment where they get the best price possible what the market will bear and so not making it so that these little tricks like bid sniping or whatever that you know people knew about certainly in ebay 
is, is part of that promise to them and we think uh, for the investors as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the next uh, platform that we have uh, available to you all for, for purchasing assets is the secondary market. So assets that are bought on our auction, on our auction platform are then relisted so that you can see uh, what has been purchased at what value, but really it's an option for liquidity for the investors that have bought assets, right? So now those assets are publicly available um, to be seen, not necessarily sold, right? Obviously we're not selling any assets that, you know, yeah. the uh, rights belong to someone else. <laughs> yeah, one of the biggest things is that, um, so after the assets originally are, are let's, let's call it originated on our platform, meaning, you know, the auction happens and, you know, now we're, we have all the track record of income that it's produced so far, and we're monitoring on an ongoing basis how the asset is performing. Well, within the secondary market, we make that information available so people can see how these assets have performed over time. And the, the owner of that asset then can set a buy it now price and say, you know what, hey, if somebody comes along and you know, some big, some private equity firm that's really, would, uh, you know, I bought it and I'm getting a 12% yield, some private equity firm that would be very happy with an 8% yield and wants to take it off my hand and I can, you know, you know, a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush sort of idea. <laughs> I can I can take profits, then then they have the option to. Or if they need liquidity, there's an active market in the secondary market where they can get it. Exactly. So it's a it's an important uh, feature for transparency, also for liquidity uh, for people who own these assets. Yeah, and I always like to say I think it's a great opportunity for newer investors to go and kind of evaluate an asset, take a look at it, see what see what maybe a buy it now price is or list price is. On those listings but without that competitive environment of an auction that can be a little stressful <laughs> exactly and then there are only so many auctions that are happening at one time whereas there are literally dozens of assets listed right. in the secondary market so it gives you a much better view on the overall market and an opportunity to really to really kind of dip your toes in and this these things anybody can really participate in exactly. so if you're interested in dipping your toe in the water uh you can do it through auctions you can do it by participating in the secondary market it's uh, i at least encourage you to poke around and see, um, you know, what's available, you know, what these assets generally sell for, you know, what the income sources are and how people bid on those differently. And we're gonna walk through um, all the information that's contained in it, but I encourage you to check it out. And you don't have to be an all access member to do any of this, to, to just get in and, and kind of dip your toe in the water. However, uh, if you're serious about investing in the space or really even understanding the asset class better, I, I, I strongly encourage you to become. <laughs> An, an all access member because you're going to get a number of benefits that you'll, you'll see here in a minute. Um, and we'll, uh, but we'll get a number of benefits. We'll walk you through them step by step, actually. I think starting with the auction house. Yeah. You know, and at the end of the day, there's a lot of features that you only see if you're uh, an all access yeah. member. And so um, we're going to actually walk through the platforms with that perspective of an all access member so that you can really see all of those benefits as we go through. Good. Let's do it. Um, so let's take a look. So first up, again, we have that auction house. We wanted to show you really a walkthrough of where to find it, what to look for. So when you go onto our main, uh, a main page, you go up to the listings tab up at the top. And then on the left-hand side, there's a button uh, for auction house. This will take you directly to all of the, the auctions that are current and past um, that are closed on our site. So you can go in there, you can look at past auctions, see what types of catalogs have been out there. Um, what types of assets have been up there. When you go into one of the listings, um, there's a lot of information, right? And it can feel a little bit overwhelming. So obviously it makes a lot of sense to start on the summary tab. So the very first tab that, that is available, the overview, where you can see obviously a number of key metrics, um, you know, the last 12 months earnings, um, who's the distributor, you know, what is the track list, um, and things like that. One of the Dollar questions I asked earlier, is this, uh, is this the composition copyright or the sound recording? Like it's all yeah. divided up here in this grid so you can see exactly what's involved and how it actually earns its money. Is it, is it earning from streaming? Is right. it, you know, and who the distributors are and so forth? Yeah, I think it's really key to look at those, those rights. Um, there's a box right there that, that outlines what those rights are so that you understand the type of asset that you're buying. Exactly. Um, as you dig a little bit deeper, the next tab over is the financials tab. Um, well, we said earlier that this is not as, while there is optionality where some, you know, something might get used or licensed in some unique way, the primary basis, the primary investment thesis that we have brought to this market is past performance, is, is looking at past performance and then based upon how it's actually performed in the past, what the trends are, and an understanding of that, you can make intelligent, thoughtful decisions about how it will perform in the future. 
And so the financials tab is really where all that data is. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this is where the real fun number crunching for like us that, number yeah. nerds, um, that's, where, that's where you can hang out. And what's not shown here is, is most, if not all, of our listings have all of the raw data, um, the supporting data in uh, forms that you can download, you can run your own numbers, run your analysis, dump it in Excel, go to town um, and really and really get into the weeds on on what those uh, that past performance has looked like um, which I think is really also key as you get more and more serious exactly. to understand these assets and, and how you view them exactly we, we definitely have some uh, very active uh, all access members who you know have to have they use the information we provide and they have their own kind of criteria because they have their own investment objectives they're trying to achieve so they download all the data pump it into their own model and then bid accordingly yeah absolutely um, so that can all be found in the, in the financials tab. There are a number of other tabs um, that you can check out. Those are the two that we really wanted to cover because it's the most information applicable, um, but you can check out everything else there as well. There's the main uh, button as well that, that allows you to watch or bid, um, which I think is really important. So when you're looking at um, a listing, there's kind of this section that calls out again, some of those really key metrics. Um, that's the current price and what, how many bids have been out there, how many bidders are out there, um, what time is left. Um, but you can watch an auction without participating, um, which really is a great way if you're brand new to this to just step in and just kind of see how it works and get notifications like you're a part of the auction if, if you had a bid out there um, without actually putting money on the line, obviously. Exactly. Um, and it's a great way to just kind of see how that buying activity kind of yeah, plays if, out. If you really want to understand the assets and the platform, I'd encourage you just to watch a couple of auctions, see the way that the, the bidding works, you know, take and see the inside view of what's actually happening and how the whole process works on our side. And um, I really think you can learn more about what we actually do if you, by, by just simply watching, by reading all of the enormous amounts of information we have available on the website. Yeah, absolutely. So we also want to walk through uh, just kind of the high level of the secondary market. So again, this is the, the other uh, part of the platform where you can buy assets that have been sold previously on the site. Um, so this looks a little bit different when you're on that listings page at the bottom, there's a section of that, um, but there's also that, that link on the left that is secondary market. Um, so when you go in there, you can see, see all of those assets. So there's a couple key things uh, worth looking for. Um, one, you can see if there's a list price. So if there is a list price, um, you can see of the two asset, uh, the two uh, assets that are listed there on the left-hand side in the in the screenshot. Um, one has a list price and one does not. If it has a list price, that means that the buyer is actively looking to sell at that price. You can it's like buy it now on on eBay. You can click and you can no negotiation. Essentially, you agree to buy it at that. It's price good to go, right? Um, if there is not a list price, you can still uh, put a bid in for that asset. Yeah. You can make an unsolicited offer. They don't have to accept it. They don't even really have to pay attention to it, but you certainly could get a nibble on that offer. You could, you could get uh, to buy an asset that exactly. way. Exactly, and then they're notified of it, of that you've placed an offer and they have a very limited time by which they can accept the offer or reject it. And it's a great way for price discovery. Again, if you're trying to just learn how the platform works, I, you know, it's not a great idea to go in and lowball bid a bunch of things. I mean, people are not, this, the people who own these assets already are not idiots. They're not going to just agree to your crazy lowball offer. But you know, going in and putting some offers that's in that seem um, that you're confident you'd be making a smart decision on was let you see how the platform works right. as well. You know, without without uh, if it's lowball enough, I guess you're not taking too much risk. But I don't right. want a bunch of lowball offers that <laughs> just confuses things. But uh, you know, you can kind of poke around. And each of these also they have another financials tab, right? The, and see the exactly. And so as you click into those listings, there's a lot of information still there, right? Um, you can you can get pretty much the same level, almost the same level of information um, as the original listing. Um, and so definitely something that, again, if you're brand new to this place, this space, you can go check out all of those different things, see what was what it was paid for. Um, or what it was bought for originally, um, or the last time anyway, if it's yep. transacted multiple times, um, which is which is starting to happen, um, yes. and uh, and really get a better feel for these assets uh, and get that different view. You can see the source breakdown there, all of those things that are really key to starting to understand these assets, how to look at them, how you think um, they may perform going forward, and, and what you would want to value them at. Um, and then another really cool feature that again is only available to our all access members is the analyst recommendation price, which yeah. was a brainchild of Matt. So, well, so, so we've always thought we've always had this idea that it's that we, in order to make sure that we're building a product that's that works for 
the investors in our marketplace, we had to actually, we had to do it ourselves. We had to understand how it actually works. So um, I have, for better or worse, my capital has been used as sort of the guinea pig capital in acquiring catalogs. And um, I have to say it's worked out really well for me in doing that for guinea pig <laughs> capital. But along that time and doing it, we've developed um, some, some heuristics, some ways of, of looking at catalogs where, as we've seen so many different catalogs, of being able to say, well, if I had to buy this blind, if I, if I didn't know what the music was at all, what would I be willing to pay for this asset? Assuming, again, I was trying to achieve, you know, portfolio returns that are somewhat in the double digits, okay? If I'm trying to achieve that, if that's my basic assumption, what could I confidently buy without having to really do much under the hood poking at all um, for any of these assets? And this number here, actually, it's labeled analyst recommendation, but the truth is we, we debated this. We, <laughs> we're gonna call it CEO's recommendation or Matt's recommendation, mm -hmm. honestly, because this is, my, this is the number that I personally would use to buy any of these assets blind. I would, I have, and I would use this number. And um, without looking at any of these specific assets, this is a, it's a formula essentially used that we use to create it. It's standard across all of the assets listed in the secondary market. And it's based fundamentally on two major criteria. The, the, the age of the catalog, the age of the earnings of the catalog, which we found to be incredibly important predicting the future uh, income of it, and, uh, and how much time is left in the term of that income stream. So it's important to mention there's two things. Uh, there's two basic structure that these assets uh, take when they're sold on our platform. The number one is that you buy the life of, right, of the rights, which life of the rights for, COT, for anything that was produced after 1978 is uh, life of the last living author plus 70 years. So three generations, basically, you're looking at right. with that, roughly. Um, so that's that life of rights. The other one is a 10-year term, where basically you're buying the right to claim all of the income from, that, from, the, from the exploitation of that right, um, as defined in the listing, over a 10-year period, after which point it reverts back to the artist. So you get, it's like a, it's, you get, it's like a, it's like a mortgage bond, in a yeah. way, right? So you get to collect the income over time. Your returns are 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 included in that return. You're 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 earning over time, and it's a very popular. It's it's very popular with artists, and it's become very popular with investors. More than half of the assets that transact on our platform are now ten year terms. So now ten year terms when they're in the secondary market, obviously they've there. This is a, a resale, so the, it isn't ten years left anymore. Right. So the formula for the analyst recommends is essentially looking at the quality of the earnings based upon the life of the earnings, um, mixed with essentially how much time is left, what the earnings period is going forward. Time adjusted. Yeah. Yes. And so it's only meant really to be a milestone um, or a benchmark for you to look at and better sort of assessing the dozens of assets that are listed there. Um, you know, just give you a sense of where, where I would, without looking at it, without really looking and seeing the, the music that's there or the source breakdown or anything, what I'd be willing to pay for it personally. Take it or leave it, but that's what I would be willing to do. And this is only available to all access members. Yeah. It's great to just have a guidepost when you're, again, new to a space, trying to figure things out. It's great to have just that, am I thinking about this roughly the right way? Exactly. Um, from someone who's obviously other. been around for a while. We've seen a number of these assets, that's for sure. We get asked for that secret sauce a lot. And exactly. Well, this, this is, is the nature of piece it. Of it right? This is the, no, this is the again, my no, my, I, I'm highly confident acquiring assets using this formula. Highly confident. That's great. So one thing that I wanted to highlight um, in particular as you're going through the two different platforms um, is that we have a, a, a vast amount of investor resources around this space and it's growing every day. Um, at the end of the day, uh, your success is our success. We really want you to feel empowered to make smart buying decisions and be successful on our platform and in this space. And so um, we've built this asset uh, library out. Um, we're continuing to do so and we have lots of proprietary metrics and analysis that we that we share particularly at all access we we really deep dive and we have just billions and billions of data points that we're extracting extracting new insights every day um, around the asset class and how they perform over time um, and so we we really use that to to help fuel uh, investment decisions of, of our investors. Exactly. We have essentially a, a, a data scientist who's just looking at these 600 billion data points, adding to it again, and we're adding to it every day, but looking at these, trying to um, you know, draw insights from it that we, that we share directly with uh, 
anything that we, we can hold on to, we, we really believe is true, we share with all access investors uh, first. Yeah, the, I mean, the stability of streaming. Exactly, um, that was that's, something, just that's a something that we recently, recently pulled we proved, out. Yeah. You know? um, and so it's certainly something that, as you are interested in this space, obviously by being on this webinar, you're interested in learning more. Um, go there, read as much as you can, because um, there is you know, no shortage of information. And ask questions, um, continue to ask questions to us, we continue to, to build more assets and, and dig into those questions and get those answered and out to everyone. That's right, that's right. Um, so I wanna also give you a quick overview. You know, there's a lot of different platforms and there's uh, different ways you can buy assets and think about assets and all that stuff. So what does it actually look like to get involved with this space, come into Royalty Exchange, become an investor member, et cetera? So um, we broke it down into six steps here and we'll just kind of kind of run through them. First is create an account. It's possible that you never created an account and you're on this webinar. It's possible. Unlikely, but probably you've already created a, a, an account on the site. Um, next, we really do recommend joining All Access. Um, if you're serious about if you're serious about investing uh, in this space, because there's just so many benefits um, that you get on the insights side. And there's a 30-day trial, so you get a you get a yeah. step in, you get access to the information that we we share with with uh, our All Access members. You get access to the key uh, statistics that are used in the secondary market to help you make better decisions. Yeah. And of course, if you are acquiring assets, you'll, as we'll talk about the benefits later, uh, a lot of the fees just disappear. And so it uh, certainly pays for itself if you're active at all. So right. I encourage you to take a look at that if you're, if you're again, if you're serious yeah. about investing in the space. Yeah, it's a great way to get up to speed faster, exactly. I think is, is the way to look at it um, with that 30 day money back guarantee. I mean, not, not that we're, not that we're <laughs> we don't want a lot to of buy that, and then take, get a refund, but I mean, We'd really take a look and find out for sure if it's for you than to than to just sit on the sidelines and never really um, venture into the space at all. Right, right. So so next we have getting verified. So this is a simple step that um, doesn't take too much time, but if you're an all access member, you're automatically verified. Um, you got to be verified to bid. Got to make sure that that, that um, the bids are legitimate. The bids, bids are legitimate. We understand kind of who these buyers are, obviously, right. um, uh, so that on the sell side they know that transactions aren't going to be falling through. Or exactly. Anything. But if you're an all access uh, member, essentially this is sort of bundled in that. So not, not really that big of a deal. The next thing is really, we want you to test the platform. We talked about watching an auction before. We think that's a great way to do it. You know, certainly digging around and, um, and looking at everything in the secondary market, seeing, you know, sorting things by this proprietary statistic we brought up before called dollar age and just sort of see how that um, affected the original purchase price and, and see yeah. the, you know, what, Connect these thing dots on your own. Just just dig around a little bit. We think you'll learn quite a bit. Again, a hedge fund was launched using our publicly available data to build their models around. So there's a lot of great insights there. If you're interested, go in and poke around. Absolutely. Um, obviously, you can then hopefully build your confidence, actually buy an asset or two, start building that portfolio. Um, and then you really just start collecting that royalty income. You know, we have a, a closing process that's pretty straightforward. We have a team that walks you through that. We have a really great team that does that. Um, there are transaction fees. Um, if, you're not, that, if you're not an all-access member, not an all -access member, it's one percent of um, the asset price, um, or five hundred dollars, whichever is greater. Um, but those are all waived if you're an all-access member as well. So again, if you're serious about investing in the space, it makes it getting, easier. It, it makes it it makes it a lot easier just yeah. by that cost. And and I just want to say, like, if you, one thing that one question we get a lot is, well, what happens after I you know I, I win an auction? Okay, now you know. The, it's closed, what does that really mean, collect the income? Well, essentially, to make this all easier and to reduce the friction in the marketplace, we launched a couple of years ago, or about a year and a half ago now, um, an administration service, essentially where at no cost, we, uh, we essentially collect and, and immediately redistribute the royalties to you. So all of the administrative stuff, working with the distributor, um, questions about making sure the payments are routed in the right direction, we actually, we take all that on because it's, we found that it was a big um, administrative burden for investors and really kind of dissuaded people from participation. So, so it really is, you know, once you close um, at the next quarterly payment, essentially you start collecting the income on it. Now, at the same time, what happens is after you bought the asset, it's, it's listed in the secondary market. You don't have to sell it, but it's there. And if some, again, some big PE firm comes along and says, you know, or you know, an insurance company that really just needs a 4% yield in right. order to, to justify themselves, they can come in and they can just, they can make you offers that uh, you know, might make you uh, decide you really ought to uh, get, get rid of the asset. So yeah. in any case, that's just return. access to liquidity is what it gives you. Yeah, absolutely.
absolutely. So the one, the one major feature we want to talk about before we wrap up, and this is only available for all access members, and we, we call it autom automated investing. And um, this essentially is something that we launched initially in the very beginning of 2019 and a very limited basis. Um, it has a couple of specific, specific benefits. And I think one of the biggest things is that they're, the, the primary way that new assets get on our platform is through auctions, but there is another way. Um, a lot of times an, an artist to go through an auction, it's very, it's, it, it feels very risky to them. They don't know what the outcome is gonna be. Uh, and there's a, just a lot of uncertainty that kind of keeps them on the sidelines. So we developed an automated way for them to be able to see what an investor is willing to pay for the catalog and to be able to accept that offer in real time. And that all happens behind the scenes. And there's a lot of assets now that actually come onto our platform that are originated essentially through that automated process and never end up seeing the light of an auction ever. Right. And we actually only see this part of the business growing over time and only all access members actually uh, get to place essentially these standing orders for catalogs and be filled um, as they come on in this, through this automated structure. Now, through this automated structure, there are pre-qualified assets. And essentially, these, uh, there, there's some heuristics we have used um, to essentially eliminate in most of the things, the, the high risk areas essentially where um, an asset might be less reliable as income history over time. For instance, if the asset is less than three years old, yeah. If it's been earning income for less than three years, it's the, the income is less likely. It's not, it's going to be more volatile it's over time good. if it's less than three years old. So that's one basic filtering mechanism we have. Yeah, we'll get more into that in a minute, I guess. Yeah. Okay. So, um, the, so the other benefit is if you're really trying to, if you're really trying to grow a catalog or portfolio of these things, it's really hard to do so if you're buying one asset for $60,000, another one for $9,000 and it's kind of a mess over time, and, and if you, but if you, if you want a really disciplined approach to acquiring them, you can essentially set an order and that order gets filled as those assets enter the secondary market. If there's something that meets your requirements, right. it gets filled into your portfolio. If there's something that's being originated on the platform, meets your requirements, it gets filled in your portfolio. And ultimately, over time, um, even uh, proxy bids would be placed on auctions. So you don't have to be monitoring constantly what new hit the market to make sure that you're you're able to you know to compete for it yeah absolutely yeah i think it's important we show just kind of how that works as well um because you will see this if you go into the secondary market um whether you're an all access member or not the tab exists um and so you'll go you can go there by just going to that secondary market and there's a tab right next to that um, where you can go in and set orders and this is basically what you're asked to set an order um and so there's just some key Metrics there, you choose, you know, do you want a term deal or a life of rights deal? Um, PRO are the only ones that we're, that we're doing using, with right doing now. with right now. Um, so the performance rights organizations distribute distributors. Um, but then you choose, you know, what dollar age you want, um, basically your multiple and then your high and low. Yeah, and here's the thing is that this isn't, Matt, you're, you're acquiring catalogs of music royalty is based upon a very limited set of information. Yeah. And the thought that most people have is, well, I don't, I don't know, like, I'm, I don't know what the music is. I mean, how could I possibly make, right. you know, how could I do this? Well, because of all the data we had, we thought that it made a lot of sense to use this approach that, that based upon a couple of simple heuristics by defining, putting some rails around an order, you could actually make sound decisions. And of course I tested it with my own capital first. Yeah. And then ultimately we rolled it out and, and uh, to, all access members and what we found is that the returns experienced by folks who have used the discipline approach of standing orders are depending upon the time period measured in, in, in the where we have the most data points it's 25 percent better returns than that 12.1 percent we showed you earlier and where we have fewer data points but a longer time period uh the the, the return is 50 percent above the 12 point uh, one percent that the average investor has Amazing. found by bidding on things in auction so the actual the disciplined approach of, of identifying the rails of what you want to buy has worked really well for the people who have participated in it yeah and i think it's interesting to to see that it is based on a very small set of criteria i think we get asked a lot you know well i can't choose genre i can't choose you know all these other things but and if those things are really important to you if, if it's not necessarily a financial outcome you're looking for then like I get, it. You, you know, you only, some people are only interested in buying a certain 
genres for whatever reason they might have, or they want to, they really need to, they feel like they need to know the catalog and that's totally fine. But if you're looking for passive interests in royalty assets, um, you know, based upon key financial rails, this is a great way to do it. Right. And the reason that this really works is because of our, our eligibility criteria for catalogs yeah. that enter this. And we started talking about this before. I can go into great detail on this if people want me to with questions. Um, yeah. for, and, and certainly uh, we're happy to talk to you know, anybody. Uh, if you're an Alexis member, yeah. and schedule time with Eric. You're happy to do a deep dive on <laughs> all of this stuff. Yeah. Um, and you know, depending on availability, we're happy to talk to anybody, but just it's right. tough with so many people. Um, the biggest thing is that dollar age is a key component. We always look at that. It's a big priority. If it's if the if the the, the catalog is declining substantially, if it's essentially if its most recent periods of earnings is 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 declining too greatly, it gets removed. If it's not earning enough in revenue, it gets removed. If if essentially the ratio between the average earnings of the last three years versus um, the most recent years off, then it gets excluded. If it's production music, it gets excluded. Blah, blah, blah. We basically, these rails basically eliminate a lot of the basic variables that you have to be very careful of um, and only make certain catalogs eligible to, for, the, for the standing orders. So if you are an all access member and you have standing orders, essentially you get a first look of sorts for the assets that are never going to otherwise, they're not going to be in the auction house. They'll go directly to the secondary market, if anything. And you're still competing on those because the highest, the highest essentially bid for a you know matching catalog is going to be filled, so it's not There's just everybody's. Going to, it's not it's, we're not. It's not a communist system here where it's just round <laughs> robin. It right. is based upon you know what produces the best outcome for the artist. Yeah, and all things considered, if orders are identical, the oldest one is the filled. oldest one. Gets the oldest one gets filled first. Um, and then I think it's always good to know this: there is no rejection right on these. Yeah, those filled orders they are binding. There's no, oh, then I get to approve if this comes through, right? There's yeah. no. It's part, of the, it's part of the arrangement. You have to understand if we're going to, because we are making a representation to an artist um, based upon what your, what your standing order is. And it's important for the integrity of the marketplace that you don't place an order unless you actually intend to fill it. To fill it. So you, you basically set the rails so that you have uh, high confidence, either by the amount of money you're willing to allocate toward it or, or whatever. But it's important that you know that you're, you're expected to actually follow through as you are with any bid that you might make on our system. Yeah, absolutely. So let's get to some questions. Yeah. And see so what do you got? We've got several questions related to taxes. Okay. All okay. right. Uh, and I'm going to kind of roll through them. Um, are these uh, 1031 exchange el eligible? No. Okay. Not, and I should say, I'm not a tax attorney. I totally heard you to talk to a tax attorney about anything. I'm going to pass on a lot of them. Okay. Yeah. But 1031, no. Okay. Um, there's very little guidance on how to account for these assets and their accountants are unhelpful. What can an investor, how can an investor educate themselves on how to um, understand the tax uh, implications for buying, from holding and getting returns, et cetera? Well, we, the best, best advice I can tell you right now is that we, we did a, we, we talked to tax accountants that focus on the space. We developed this all access member piece based upon that and shared it with all the all access members. And, um, We'll make that broadly available to anybody who's attending the webinar today. So we'll share with you what we got from the tax attorneys. And then I would encourage you again to consult your own before you, you know, make any big decisions. Do we issue any tax uh, documentation, 1099s, et cetera? Yeah, uh, there are 1099s, 1099s that are issued um, on any income that is, that is paid out from these royalties, yes. Okay. Uh, royalty income, is it uh, classed as dividend income? Is it capital gains? Tax question again. I'm <laughs> talking to a tax account about this, but imagine you have you have income. It's ordinary income, but it's offset through amortization, essentially. Right. Right. So um, it is ordinary income, but it's offset through amortization. So if you you know if you if you're on a ten year depreciation schedule, essentially, and it's earning a ten percent yield, then theoretically, uh, there's no tax due. Consult your tax account. Yeah. Talk to your talk to your tax. Several questions related whether we're planning on putting together any kind of a fund. Uh, there are folks that are looking to uh, have less volatility, reduce risk, diversifying across different assets. Um, uh, they like the, the tax advantage of uh, lower purchase multiples via the exchange. Um, so are, basically, are we ever planning on, on uh, starting our own fund that you can invest across multiple royalties? Great. So the question is if we're ever planning to start a fund because of the, the advantages of being able to deploy capital. If you, if you really want to invest in a fund, I would encourage you to really look at the other options. That, that we talked about already, not us. I, our goal is to be the market. Right. And um, we have been approached by many, many funds or 
large or big moneyed individuals who essentially want us to put together a fund, essentially use the information we have to help them get a strategic advantage in acquiring. And um, ultimately, our, we made a decision a long time ago and said to focus on building a market that's effective instead of focusing on acquiring assets. As I said earlier, maybe I'm personally making a huge mistake by spending my capital and trying to build this business versus acquiring the assets myself. But I really believe it's ultimately paid. If we don't do this, if we don't build the market like this, no one will, it'll stay restricted to, to insiders, whether they be the labels or publishers or hedge funds. And I just think that uh, these assets will never be fairly valued if they aren't made broadly available to, to investors. Okay. Um, we kind of got into this, but can maybe just clarify a little bit about uh, whether or not what we sell have joint um, owners and are you buying only one person's share? Do you need to get the other person's permission to buy? Um, yeah. That sort of thing. Okay, so, so a lot of a songwriter, any song that you listen to might have two songwriters, could have five, could have more. And each of those songwriters essentially are paid out by the distributors, by the PROs. They're paid out their proportional share you know, in the, in, in the royalties that are earned. Now, when one of those songwriters comes to us and wants to um, get liquidity for their royalty income, they have the right without consulting the other rights holders about selling their property, okay? It's their property, they can sell it. Um, when they do that, you don't need to consult anyone else. And when you're doing that, whatever is listed in any, in any of our listings, whether it be an auction or the secondary market, the asset that you're buying is the asset that, uh, for which the income is the the historical income is reported, it's not a portion of that. Um, it's all of that. So if 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 for instance there's one songwriter who has a one fifth share in a song, and that one songwriter but no one else is selling their interest, the income, the historical income that you see in the financials tab is going to be only on their part, only on the part that's actually available through the site. Right. Why does anyone sell their revenue stream? Well, I mean, <laughs> that's a great question. I mean, I listen. It's, it's uh, one of the basic tenets that we have around here is that you know that the cert a certain amount of capital injected into a person's life at the certain amount of time can have a huge impact on them. And so, a lot of these sometimes it's heirs, and they've been holding on to it. But you know, they and this is a great source of income for them. But they need a, 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 a larger amount of capital in order to be able to buy a home, and you know. Like, could be the songwriter themselves, not an heir. Same situation. Um, Find a college fund. Exactly. I mean, you, you might need, sometimes you need a lump sum of capital. You could have a great income stream, but you need a lump sum of capital. And you go, well, well, there's all, you know, money's cheap these days. There are options for these people. But here's the thing is if you're a songwriter, this is what you do career wise. How do you walk into a bank and then understand what you do? You look like you're unemployed to them. You don't get a, you don't get a W2 from anybody. You know, there's nobody withholding a 401k for you and your, and your, and your income is, is, uh, you know, shows up quarterly without, um, you know, and it can vary dramatically. A year ago could have been in one quarter, you might've got a hundred thousand dollars. And in the last quarter, you got $8,000 and to a banker, what are they supposed to do with that? So there's not really great access to capital for most of these. Uh, I mean, if you're Drake, there's plenty of access to capital, <laughs> right? But if you're, if you're a songwriter, one of the many songwriters for Drake, and we've had Drake, uh, works on their platform. They don't have access to the capital in the same way. And for the first time, we get them fairly priced access to capital and really open up a whole world of opportunities for them where they can, what they do, what they need the money for, what they choose to do with it, of course, is up to them. Right. Lots of questions about our administrating of the, of the payments. Um, uh, what, A, what's the credit risk exposure to us, Royalty Exchange, if we go wonder what happens to the payments that we're administering? Okay, so let's start with that. What's the credit risk? Because uh, if someone acquires an asset on the platform, um, we are acting as an intermediary to ensure that the payments are flowing properly from the PRO, like an ASCAP or DMI, to the investor. And so what's the credit risk? Well, ultimately, the contract between for the sale of the asset is not between Royalty Exchange and you. It's between the seller of the asset and um, you know, and, and the investor, the buyer of the asset. So you are the individual who is, who is entitled to those royalties, regardless of our presence or not. And our, we're there for sake of convenience, to make it all easier, to make it so you can participate, so you can, so you don't have to, well, there's two reasons. One, so it's easier for you, lower friction for you in collecting those royalties. And we can make sure the first payments, especially are routed properly. 
The secondly is that these organizations like ASCAP and BMI are just not set up to interact with hundreds of individual investors. They're set up to interact with rights holders, with songwriters and publishers. They're not set up to deal with individual investors. And um, the questions and, and, uh, and extra customer service burden it creates on, on these organizations is so substantial that it was one of the key things that pushed us over the edge and said, these guys are just gonna shut down. They're gonna like become very uncooperative if we create this huge administrative burden for them. So we chose to bring that administrative burden in-house at our cost in order to make it so that these transactions could continue to be possible and easy for everyone involved. What if I want them paid directly to me and not through royalty exchange? Is that possible? It, it is possible. And, 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 when, and we, we, strong, we try, we, we'll try and talk to you about why it's probably a mistake, but it certainly is possible. There are certain instances where we've done it. Um, most people find that doing it through us is better because, of, because it's, they get reversed. The payment flow is, is monitored by us to ensure it's all happening right. We don't take any part of that fee. We immediately turn around payment to the, to the investor. And ultimately, we keep track of how it's performing. So if you want to actually liquidate it at any point, you can do it easily. And you can always also, uh, you become eligible then for some wild bids potentially, uh, people who wanna actually acquire bulk uh, assets through the secondary market. So you lose that because we lose the ability to monitor the ongoing income stream. Um, basically some marketing questions. Uh, if I bought, purchased the rights, uh, is there anything that prevented me from marketing it on, on my own, uh, influencing the value of it after I've, I've purchased it? Well, you don't have, so there's nothing, there's nothing preventing you from doing that, but you don't have the legal authority to, um, to, to, to essentially license the, 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 royal, the rights to anyone else, because that is actually that right. The songwriter doesn't have that right. That right is actually maintained by the publisher. And so the song, you're basically taking the songwriter's position sort of in the, you know, in the stack and uh, theirs is a passive interest and you're sort of stepping into their role. There are some instances, there are a few assets that have been sold on the platform where copyrights were included. There's one where we sold essentially all of the assets of a record label, for instance. And in that case, the person is buying these things and the copyrights and can go and exploit them however they see fit. But for the most part, this is designed to be a passive investment for folks. And um, there's really not much more you can do around it anyway. Uh, some questions around the listings. Can you can you explain more about the uh, internal rate of return estimate projections? What forms the basis? Is it an algorithm? Yeah, et cetera. Great question. So, we we do, we use we, our goal is to like benchmark things, just like we do with the analyst recommends in the secondary market, and you know what we call a theoretical rate of return. Um, you know, in each listing is it's, a, it's, it's created programmatically. Actually, the formula for exactly how it's calculated is in the listings area, and you can get in and you can see exactly how it's done. It's, it's pretty simplistic, and it's designed essentially to be able to allow you to compare one asset to another. It's not our prediction of exactly how it's going to perform over time, because we aren't individually looking at any of these assets in that way. Right. Um, instead, what we're doing is we're trying to give you a, a kind of a benchmark, just to begin to understand it, begin to understand how one might compare to another, so if you see enough of them over time, you can start to develop your own opinion and make smart decisions on your own. Can you explain the buyback clause in contracts? Okay, uh, so the question is, can we explain the buyback clause in contracts? It's very rare in, the, in anything that's sold on our platform. Uh, a few years ago, it was, it was more common, but still, it's extremely rare that it ever occurs now. Now, when that, so it's almost not worth it going into because there's, really, <laughs> there's basically nothing that that's the case for that I'm aware of and hasn't been for quite a while. But when it does exist, essentially, there's within, it says in the listing very clearly that the, uh, the songwriter or the rights holder, whoever they might be, have a right within a, a very defined time period that's listed in the listing to buy back the rights uh, from the investor at a known return to the investor. So it's very limited. It secures a profit for the investor. But again, it's, it's basically non-existent on our platform anymore. Can you discuss dollar age a little more and explain, you know, what it is? What does a low dollar age mean compared to a high? How to incorporate that into your, there's a lot of confusion around that. Yeah, dollar age. So the question is about dollar age and in the way we think about it, what it really means and what the difference between a low dollar age and a high dollar age is. The easiest way to think about it in a, in a, from a simple standpoint is this, is that if the catalog is older, 
Um, it is the earnings are likely to be far less volatile. The quality of those earnings are likely to continue over time. It's using a simple heuristic that if you anybody, if you guys out there, you know, are Nassim Taleb fans, it's the, the Lindy effect, essentially the Lindy law, which basically says that something, and when especially with creative works, something is likely to exist for as long as it's existed so far. So if something has been out, if something has been earning revenue for five years, it's likely to continue earning revenue for another five years. Now, whether that's that actual model is true or not, isn't really the point. The point is that if it's been earning for only three years, it is less likely than a catalog that's been earning for 10 years to be earning money 10 years from now. And it's just, again, it's a for comparison and contrast standpoint. And um, we've seen in looking at the data that it, it directly relates to the, you know, the, I, I mean, I refer to it as a measure of the quality of earnings, like the likelihood they're gonna continue in the future, the likelihood of lower volatility exists there. And I'm willing, personally with my own money and have bought assets, again, using a programmatic approach that uses dollar age as the paramount um, uh, principle in, in acquiring the catalogs. So another question about age, but not dollar age, just basically some talking about, um, just can you, can the people assume the returns will go down as catalogs age or will technology, you know, perhaps make them more steady. Also with the amount of new songs entering the, the space, how does that affect le legacy catalogs um, diluting their, you know, their performance? Yeah, so let's talk about first about older catalogs, you know, uh, with older catalogs, in the streaming world where there's so much new music essentially and, and so much accessibility music on these platforms, how does that affect these older catalogs? Well, it was for a long time, the vast majority of the revenue that's produced in the music business came from, uh, came from new music, came from music that had been out less than 18 months. There was a, a time period, maybe it was about a year ago, um, which Gary was in the room, he could correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was about a year ago where there was a report that said for the first time ever, that uh, what's called deep catalog, which is a uh, catalog, this is the way the music business looked at it. Deep catalog was anything over 36 months old. Deep catalog was for the first time ever earning half of all of the revenue that was being produced. And so essentially streaming has been a boon for back catalog. Think about it before we had to buy in a record store a long time ago, the record store can only have so many titles. It'd be the new stuff that's popular and it'd be some classics. And then other things just, they would just simply would not be available. To, to music users, but now, you know, the whole world of music is available and the back catalog, there's a huge resurgence in it. And it's a huge portion of, of, of why the music business is doing so well now is the consumption of deep catalog. So from that standpoint, it's only positive for deep catalog. Uh, Anthony, you had another question sort of related to that? Basically just the, um, the do all catalogs naturally decline over time? Uh, do all catalogs decline over time? This is a great question. So um, if music, is commercially successful it has a it does kind of follow some kind of a pattern when it's new and released um, frequently there's a spike in earnings as it goes in popularity especially if it's really successful there's a spike in earnings you know it's 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 played a lot you might listen to it over and over again you know when you first find this music you really like it you yourself might listen to it 10 times in a row but ultimately that kind of tamps down and the income falls pretty drastically within this within this very narrow time frame, within the first couple of years. And, but then after that, it sort of levels off. And you know, from there, it's when, and this is why for the standing orders, we, to be eligible for standing orders, uh, the catalog has to have a dollar age of greater than three. Right. Because once it's gone through that kind of earning cycle, the income uh, starts to look like something that you can model on, and then you can break, predict better. And what you find with certain catalogs, especially as the, more and more money is being pushed into the music industry through all the things we've talked about already. Um, I mean, the consumption of music and more royalties being earned in general, that's, a, um, it's causing like a rising tide that's lifting all boats. Now, in that environment, the better music does better. So for instance, um, you know, we did, uh, some of you may have actually participated in a Dire Straits catalog offering we did. And, you know, the income from that, I'm trying to remember, make sure I got this right, but I, I think if I got this right, the, the actual revenue produced by the royalties of that catalog grew 12% year over year. And Dire Straits is a band that disbanded 25 years ago or more. And so they haven't been doing, they're not, this is old, deep catalog by any measure. 
and be, but it's great music. And, and as the music industry is growing, it's growing. The, you know, it's where some numbers are growing by seven percent from ASCAP and BMI. These guys, their their income from it grew by twelve percent. So, just because older music doesn't mean it's necessarily declining in income. We see a lot of catalogs. A lot of catalogs I bought personally have grown. There have been some that declined slightly though. Um, do we allow for group investing, or is it only individuals? And if is there any work around through that process? Well, the assets on our platform, they're not securities, so you're not allowed to securitize them. As soon as you start sort of assembling buyer groups, um, you know, we don't do that. And, uh, you, know, we, you, know, we, you know, if you are a registered fund, I mean, we definitely have hedge funds who buy on our platform and other institutional investors that are pulling capital. So what you do on that side is, you know, you of course can do as long as you're following the regulations on it. Um, for us, their assets, it's an asset purchase, like buying a house or buying a car or buying Beanie Babies on eBay. Um, can I put assets in, my, uh, in a business name or does it have to be my name? It could certainly be in a business name. Some people, um, some people buy these assets in a trust. Some people buy them in, in their name. They buy them in a, in a company name, it, whatever, that's up to you. Uh, we mentioned a number of risks earlier. Uh, what do we have any fail-safe measures in place uh, in case any of those risks come into play, and what do we do to mitigate any of the risks that were that were noted? Well, what you know, what we do on our platform is we we mitigate most of these risks by basically making a huge swath of the potential assets totally ineligible to be available on our platform. So the vast majority of of the risks are essentially handled there. From there. Our process, our process is standardized. The contracts are standardized. We work with distributors who we, you know, where we know, um, you know, you can clear and transfer title effectively. So the biggest risks are sort of resolved there. Now you always have the valuation risk. You know, some people get in bidding frenzies. One sort of funny side note: um, we had the asset at, uh, for producer royalties for the film Trading Places come onto our platform, and it got picked up and and was in every Wall Street trader in the country, it showed up on their Bloomberg terminal, this was available. And this is an iconic trading movie. And all of a sudden we saw a huge onrush of people wanting to get registered as bidders and the bidding was definitely irrational. Now these are people who you know, should certainly understand what you know, valuation stuff, yeah, Wall Street people, um, but they got quite irrational. Clearly they were doing it for bragging rights and then they paid an outrageous multiple for it. And there's really no way to protect you from, you know, um, from trying to find score bragging points with your trading friends. That's for sure. A uh, lot more questions still. Um, so do we have any data on whether TV or movie or other sync placements influence streaming um, activity and value? High value placements and syncs absolutely have an effect. I mean, sometimes you, um, new artists can break through because of, because they are fortunate in getting synced. But, you know, there's not having control over those things because we're taking a passive position. We haven't really investigated deeply the relationship between the two. Could be something we look at in the future. Sure. Okay. Um, talk a little bit about the uncorrelation and also, uh, you know, do, do these investments react to recessions? Do they tend to lag behind or hold their value? Yeah, this is something I can speak to um, that we're actually working on right now, a research reporter on this. Um, early findings are that, that they are truly statistically backed that they're un, fairly uncorrelated to markets, um, very uncorrelated actually yeah. to markets. Um, but ultimately, uh, we have a bit more digging to do to really prove that out to yeah. kind of. Yeah, I think one of the things is there's just two elements to look at. The, the value of the assets in any great market turmoil could plummet as you know, people seek liquidity, but the income produced by those, by the assets is unlikely, it's not paired to the bond market, it's not paired to the stock market, it's paired to this big bull market in the licensing of music royalties. So that is uncorrelated. The specific price of an asset, if you had to get liquidity, there's a shortage of liquidity, probably would, would be affected. If I acquire something on the royalty exchange, can I sell only a part of that on the secondary market rather than the whole thing? We, okay, so if someone buys something on, on our platform, could they sell a portion of what they bought on our platform in the secondary market? No, they can't. Um, essentially, because again, we don't get into dividing assets and allowing multiple participants in it. So these are single assets. It's like saying, if you bought a home, could you cut out a bedroom and make it put that, you know, on a, um, Zillow for sale? Mm. You know, it'd be hard, I think. So no, these assets, once originated on our platform, they stay as they are.
what do I get as an auction winner as proof of ownership? Well, you have the contract between the buyer and seller is the key thing. Ultimately, the, the person who has the rights, they, have, they sign a contract with you that, that says that they give you these rights and, and actually the terms of those agreements are available. The question was, how do you, what do you get after you buy something on site to prove that you bought it? Um, every transaction on the platform, you're entering into a contract with the seller of the asset. So that contract is the underlying proof. Um, subsequent to the map that these authorities like ASCAP and BMI are redirecting payments essentially, you know, in to fulfill that, uh, that contract. Uh, in the secondary market, do I get access to what was originally paid for the asset? Well, I mean, the secondary market, you can see what, in this, uh, sorry, I'm supposed to repeat the questions. In the secondary market, do you get access to what was originally paid for the asset? Uh, you can see in the secondary market what the, what the last transaction price was. In fact, you can even see a link that'll take you so you can see the original auction listing and all the details on it. And you can see the subsequent earnings that that catalog has had since then. Now, whether or not that investor that the holder of that asset is going to sell it to you at that price is, of course, up to them. Uh, any chance of doing anything like the M&M rights idea from a little while ago, the royalty flow? Any chance of doing uh, anything like the M&M rights thing we tried to do a while ago, uh, something called royalty flow. Um, I think that today there are people that are doing this. Uh, I mean, I think that hypnosis is doing this. There was when we, when we first um, engaged in that effort, I mean, our thought this was not an option. And we thought that making, having a public market option available could really be good for the overall market. It seems like they're doing a great job of it. If you want, if you want to pursue that, I would encourage you to look further into them or others. Uh, let's see, um, what do, do accredited investors have access to anything different on, on the platform? Um, you don't have to be an accredited investor to, to, to buy these assets, because again, they're not securities and it's not subject to all of that. Um, we have in the past, we have done some what we call private syndicates. Uh, private syndicates are rare and we do those sort of opportunistically. Uh, the Dire Straits one I mentioned before was one we did it on. And um, those are available only to all access members and, there, and you have to be an accredited investor to participate in those. So if those come, come along and they, you know, we're always open to them if it's the right arrangement, if it works for, the, for our investors. Um, then, and you're an all access member, you would have to be accredited and you would be able to have the opportunity to participate in those. Yeah, and I think it's, it's good to mention, um, so this is a question we do get a lot around private syndicates and um, how many will, more will we be doing and things like that. And um, as Matt has said, I mean, we certainly are open to doing them and more opportunistically, we, we would do that. Um, the fact of the matter is the, the market has changed. There is more competition for these assets. Um, they're typically much larger, very well-known artists. Um, and so, what we have found is that at the end of the day, they're not the same returns that people are looking for when they're coming to royalty exchange, right? We have talked about the 12.1%. You probably should not expect to see that in any form of private syndicate because those deals are so highly uh, sought after by larger funds, a lot of bigger players. Um, there's a lot more competition that drive that ultimate the price up for sellers, which drives returns down for investors. Exactly. The, the average asset that transacts on our platform, essentially there, there aren't active other bidders for it. Like there is no market for the, the for assets that aren't earning huge amounts of money already. So these large catalogs, if they aren't a large catalog, there's not an active competitive market for it. And that's what, you know, that's why we exist is to sort of create that. On the other side, you have hypnosis, you have round hill, you have influence media and other new entrants that are coming into the space, along with the labels and publishers, they're actively competing on, on for deals that, that they, that are worth their time doing. But if it's, which means basically something that's probably on average about $3 million or greater, but there is this sort of space in between that and, um, you know, people that are earning only, you know, $10,000 a year that um, where we fill that gap. And, and honestly, that's where the yield opportunities are clearly there. None of the private syndicates have produced the same, average return that we see from the assets that are bought on auction, on auction on our platform. I have uh, all access uh, membership questions here. Uh, to justify the $5,000 entry fee, it looks like one would need to invest more than $100,000 uh, every year. Is that right? Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, to, to, if you're just looking at the price part of it, you'd have to deploy enough capital to offset those expenses. Of course, that's true. Um, 
but there are other things, parts of it that go too. You get access to catalogs that just simply don't get originated through the auction house. Uh, you get access to insights, how you even understand these assets compared to others. You get access to some of these proprietary statistics, and we're constantly improving what's offered to investors. I mean, one of the biggest focuses for us at this point is really leveraging the data set that we have and that we're building. And frankly, the chief beneficiaries of that are going to be all access members over time. Absolutely. Uh, how many standing orders have we had in the past year? Um, and how many have been left in EDP? I don't know if you know how many. Well, you know, actually, you can you can go to this. Is, we're all about transparency. You can actually go into the website right now, and you can see the actual standing orders that are there right now. That if it ca that will be filled when um, you know when when a, when a songwriter comes through and, and gets the automatic um, offer to our platform. So you can see all the standing orders yourself by by going in there. Do all access members um, get access to uh, the method for determining the recommended price uh, that we list? Yes. How do we come up with that price? Yeah, I, I will happily share exactly the math behind that price and you can you know, come up with your own format. In fact, uh, there was one of the things we were debating when we launched that was uh, defaulting to my formula and then allow you to kind of tweak the variables for your own and then have that sort of uh, you know, listed essentially for every asset that's there. So that's if that's a popular request for feature, we'll certainly add it. Um, how do you enforce who actually gets paid what is due? Is there, is there an auditing process? Do we? Yeah, I mean, this is one of the, the right. this is one of the really important things. This is kind of gets into the counterparty risk. Um, the vast majority of the transactions that happen on our platform are, are essentially assets that are managed by the major PROs, ASCAP and BMI. So they have the, the legal authority to collect these royalties on behalf of songwriters. And you can only be, you can be either ASCAP or BMI, one of the two. And essentially it's, with them that um, sort of the transfer of title takes place or the redirection of royalties takes place. So this, this independent authority is the one um, who's sort of redirecting the, the, the royalties. You're not relying on a songwriter to write you a check every quarter, you know, or anything like that. It's, uh, it's all handled sort of um, before, you know, the songwriter or the other rights holders actually get paid at all. I mean, it's just divided at the source. Lots of questions still? There's a lot more questions still. Okay, yes. well, if you're still on, I encourage you to click on the link, use your offer code and sign up for all access uh, membership because especially if you have a lot of detailed questions, scheduling a call with Eric uh, is a way that they can, we can get into that. There's obviously we have 27,000 registered users. It's impossible for us to uh, really um, talk to all of them. So we yeah. save that for all access members. So, so let's go ahead. What other questions you have? Well, no, there are only a few folks left on the call and we've got a lot of questions still. So maybe we might try to follow up later with some of these yeah. as well, because these are actually the most we've ever received hands down. Um, but basically, I'm just going to try to get to the top uh, level ones here. Um, I, I can't even read some of these, to be honest with you. It, it, what happens if how, how to handle if I die? Is there a, is there a, a, a trust, a will, this, these kinds this, of transferring so processes? So what, what happens if you if you acquire some royalties and you pass away? Well, we all will pass away eventually, so you can count on it. Um, it's just <laughs> another asset in your estate, so making sure it's listed in your will and it can be reassigned, redirected from there. So it's you just got to make sure that people know it exists to make sure that actually your heirs can benefit from it. Is the ownership history of these assets publicly available? It's difficult to see i mean i guess somebody if they were a uh, kind of an internet detective could probably Sweet. figure it out but i think that certainly and you know everything um comes from the rights holders as it's originated on our platform we keep track of it at that point as title is transferred along the way um one of the things we plan to do over time is actually kind of uh, make really produce something that is actually an actual title that shows how it's actually transferred from one party to another over time but you could dig and find it. If I, if I buy a royalty and the payment flow suddenly stops during my ownership, who's responsible for um, fighting the battle to get those payments reinstated? Right. So the question is, if, uh, if, you, if you bought a, a royalty stream, you've been, let's say you've been earning royalties for two years and then all of a sudden it stops, who's responsible for making sure that, um, you know, it, it, you are being paid properly, that, you know, if something nefarious is happening or there's some sort of problem. Ultimately, the contract is between the two parties. It's between the seller and the buyer. And so ultimately you have recourse with the seller if something is happening that shouldn't be happening. Um, you know, somehow they've been able to redirect. But the, 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 the transactions that we focus on are, are ones that, it's, uh, it's, that can't really happen. Um, 
but ultimately the responsibility again is you pursuing it with the person you bought it from, just like any other transaction. However, you know, our staff has helped uh, investors with questions like this before, help them understand what's happening and, um, you know, help advise them about how to handle it if there's a, ever any discrepancy. Can you address possible reputation risk? Streaming services remove an artist's song, um, R. Kelly, for example. Yeah, this is the this is one thing that's out there, of course, you know, uh, the R. Kelly, Michael Jackson, who knows what's going to happen with that? This, these things could resurface, and that is a risk. That is something that's there, and I don't think there's any way to really account for it. Is there a minimum earnings amount an asset must reach before it's listed on your site? Uh, we we don't work with assets that uh, have earned, that are not earning a thousand dollars a year at this point. We're we're looking at maybe changing that, but actually we we're testing it with our capital to see if it's inherently more risky. But at this point, it's the thousand dollars is the is the standard it has to meet. Uh, can you use a self-directed IRA? Yes, you can. You use a self-directed IRA. The answer is yes. We are almost to the end here. Uh, let's see here. Some of these are a little more tactical. How are mechanical royalties covered as part of a purchase? Yeah, mechanical royalties are not paid through PRO. It's a different distributor essentially. Mm -hmm. But it all still, again, can be, you know, uh, we can still administer it on behalf of the purchaser to make sure payments are flowing properly. Can I pay via PayPal? No. Uh, can you pay via PayPal? No, you cannot. Do, do you list the assets that you've purchased to be notified in the market? Great question. I mean, I have, I'm a guinea pig. So actually, so um, the first secondary market assets, of course, had to be my own. And yes, I have sold whether I... To, whether I, I will ultimately regret it or not, I've sold several assets through the secondary market. And um, because, you know, I'm trying to demonstrate that, you know, liquidity could be achieved in the early innings when it was really just me. So yes, I have sold some. Do I wish I hadn't sold any of them? Would I rather have them? Was it worth selling? I would rather have them, but I'm trying to prove the market works. So I, I was willing to let them go for the, um, for the sake of the market. Okay. Um, why do some rights holders insist on trusts? Okay, so there's certain assets that um, certain songwriters who are only are not earning more than twenty-five thousand dollars a year. This is an ASCAP rule. Are not allowed to sell the light their assets, uh, their royalties for the life of rights, unless they do it unless they actually use a trust as an intermediary. So, in the cases where an artist was earning twenty thousand dollars a year or whatever and wanted to sell life of rights. Um, you know, they can create a trust and we've made them available that way. But for the most part, people that are in that lower income threshold end up doing 10 year terms at this point and no trust is required, which honestly makes it easier for everybody. Last question. Last question. How do you compare with Songvest? Songvest, uh, I, I don't know. Um, Songvest doesn't really, the Songvest done $20 million in transactions last year. They have done 27,000 registered investors of 800 transactions. I mean. Listen, there's lots of other people that are actually participating in this and the more the merrier as far as we're concerned. Um, ultimately, the difficulty in this place is, as you can see, there's a lot of investor interest. Um, it's actually aggregating this very fragmented supply yep. is the difficulty. And anybody that can help do that effectively is great for the market. And if they do it, then great. And if some, anyone else want, does it, it's all good. As far as we're concerned, we're, again, the big playground there's no reason why if someone bought an asset um, through SunGrest, for instance, that it couldn't actually, uh, we'd have to bet it first to make sure it met our standards, but it could be realistic in our market. It's certainly possible. So as long as it met our standards, it could. So that's it. So folks, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed this. We certainly did. Uh, again, uh, if, you, if you've bought assets on the platform before, by becoming an All Access member today, you can get a credit for basically all that you've spent so far um, in terms of transaction fees and uh, get an additional $500 discount and lock in that for the end of time. So I encourage you to do that. And um, I yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah, thanks for joining. And um, I look forward to speaking with many of you uh, in the next week or so. Awesome, thank you very much. Have a great night, folks. Thank you.